Hi, it's Mark Evans, and you're listening to Marketing Spark, which features conversations with entrepreneurs and marketers about business, sales, and of course, marketing. Many brands are heavily invested in direct mail to attract and engage prospects and customers. Direct mail can be personalized, tracked, drive online and offline sales, and support the entire customer journey. Dave Fink, the CEO and founder of Posty, lives and breathes in this world as a direct mail expert. In today's episode of Marketing Spark, we're going to take a deep dive into direct mail marketing and how it plays with social media and other platforms. Welcome to Marketing Spark. Thanks for having me. I've listened to a bunch of other podcast interviews that you've given, and obviously the sexy part of your story is your involvement with Dollar Shave Club. Everyone knows how successful that was and how marketing played such an amazing role in driving the brand and ultimately billion dollar uh, acquisition by Unilip. Walk me through your journey with Dollar Shave Club, which I guess started with an incubator or an accelerator called Science Inc. That's correct. Look, it's, it is a fascinating story and I've never seen anything quite like it before. That entire story really unfolded in four years, which I guess in internet time is is maybe eight years or 10 years. But when you think of an entrepreneur starting with an idea, a category, a product or a service they want to disrupt or improve and bring that to market, drive awareness, become really a household name globally, scare the pants off of $50 billion incumbent and then get acquired for 10 figure plus outcome that that's that that doesn't happen very often. My, my involvement, yeah, I, I got to see it from the start. So I was a partner at a, at a tech studio in Santa Monica called Science, and we had a focus on, on marketing technology, investments, and, and a business creation, as well as direct-to-consumer brands. So now I think we're all buying from brands that, that, that were created online in a direct-to-consumer direct way, but it's still pretty, pretty early back in, I think this is 2011. And, and Mike Dubin, who is a, a first-time entrepreneur, but a very experienced, I think, creative mind, had, had this idea to go right at the men's grooming sector, starting with, with razors, which I think everybody said considered that business suicide. No one really had been able to put a dent into Gillette for, for many, many years. And, and, and that was because they owned retail distribution, wholesale distribution, and, and the world changed. And, and so literally, Mike showed up and and was looking um, to raise capital and figuring out ways to get this this concept off the ground. And we just, we were fortunate to, enough to convince him to to do it with us at, at Science. And, and we were first money into his, his venture. We saw the launch of the website. We saw the, the creation and explosion of awareness through his you know, amazing viral video and, and follow-up videos. And we saw him grow a business that acquired, I, I, you know, I, th I think between three and four million subscribers within just a few short years. It was, it was, it was incredible. Let's take a step back. Mike Dubin, very personable, charismatic, creative person, walks into your office with this idea of taking on Gillette and all the big razor makers. What was your first impression? Were you impressed by his, the way he carried himself? Were you impressed by his vision or his audacity? Why did you decide to strike a partnership with Dubin when he made the viral video and, and sort of emerged as this very dynamic entrepreneur? It was easy to see, to see why, yeah, that makes sense. What spurred on your involvement with Mike and the Dollar Shave Club? Yeah. So at, at that point, subscription commerce, which I think is a pretty common uh, method for engaging with consumers these days, was was kind of just becoming a common business model. And, and it was a thesis that we were spending a lot of time researching, playing, thinking about, right? And it's the, this idea of how do you both introduce consumers to or prospect consumers to your product offering and then how do you think about investing advertising dollars to acquire consumers at scale? And one of the methods is, as probably many of your listeners think about, is, is this idea of understanding what your customer acquisition cost is, and then understanding what your expected lifetime value and lifetime margin is of that customer to know just how aggressively you can kind of spend into your growth. One of the things that was, was interesting about subscription commerce is there's... In theory, there's a built-in lifetime value because you're not just acquiring a one-time transaction like you may 
do it at a Walgreens or a CVS or Longs or whatnot. You're acquiring a customer that's buying into this idea of being a part of a club or accepting the convenience along with the quality product or fair pricing that you can get direct to consumer. To us, what was interesting is that that this fell smack within that category of an obvious need or consumer willingness to, to engage and, and commit to this idea of a subscription. It's a consumable product. You go through razor cartridges. There was kind of a built-in, you know, mechanic. Whereas there are other businesses that we've all seen where they've like tried to force this subscription model into business that that doesn't necessarily make sense. I don't need a new pair of shoes every three months. I might like a new pair of shoes every three months, but I don't know when my soles are going to wear out or whatnot. But with razors, you you generally know that each month you need more blade. That that was a that was appeal one, just kind of that 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 business model. Appeal two was, I mean, look, Mike is as as you you have know, said, he's just a dynamic, larger than life personality. Had a tremendous amount of passion. He had incredible motivation, and he had this vision of telling of kind of cracking this this kind of formula of, of digital storytelling in an era where social media was just becoming social media. I mean, you, you, like we all take for granted what YouTube is and what Facebook is now, but this was 11 years okay. ago, those platforms still existed, but marketers had not yet figured out how to crack the formula of how to engage consumers and delight consumers through those platforms at that time. And and Mike had a bit of a twinkle in his eye and the nature of his background um, had him well positioned to, to be a storyteller first as a marketer and then maybe a customer acquisition engine second. So you put those those together and, and it seemed like an interesting project um, to engage with. I am not going to claim that any of us had any idea that he was going to launch this video. It was going to you know, go viral overnight and he was going to be sold out and and scrambling to figure out how to build his infrastructure literally overnight that, that no one could have predicted or certainly we didn't. Yeah. When people look at the success of Dollar Shave Club, they focus, laser focus on that viral video, which he made for a few thousand bucks and opened the floodgate for sales and a arguably a global brand. When you as a marketer look at Dollar Shaves Club's success, aside from the viral video, what do you see as some of the things that Dollar Shave Club was really effectively allowed to embrace? What did it do well? Where did it stand out? And 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 how were those marketing decisions made? They did a lot of things really well. I mean, you obviously don't um, have that level of success if if you didn't do a lot of things well. And and you know, I think you know, Mike's traveled around the world speaking to business school classes and MBA programs, trying to deconstruct some of that success. When I look at it, first and foremost, and and I've I've talked about this in in some of the 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 other you know podcast conversations I've had, and I really truly believe in it. There, there are there are two types of businesses that. I've seen created and had the benefit of kind of getting a front row seat to seeing dozens and dozens of businesses launch, just being in this this market, in this world, and then certainly being at a at a company that was built around investing in and, and launching startups. The kind of div- big divide that I've seen is that there are those businesses that start out opportunistically and those businesses that start out mission driven. And and what I mean by that is there's no shortage of companies where the founders come from the industry that they're playing in with their next business. They have deep expertise. They understand a supply chain or something about improving a product or service, and and they they have a business model that they know that they could that they could monetize. And 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 those are fine. There are lots of businesses that have been wildly successful built kind of opportunistically. To me, what's more interesting is these mission driven businesses. And I don't mean you're out trying to solve the most challenging problems in the world. What I mean is like you've uncovered a problem or, or a solution or a pain point that is real or even that there's a perception of in the consumer psyche or business psyche, and you're mission driven around trying to solve that pain point. It could be really nuanced and focused. It could be broad. Well, if you look at Dollar Shave Club, I mean, from the start, as that amazing script and viral video to, you know, talked about, there was a bit of a pain point in in you know, in men's grooming and razors in particular, razors were um, tracked as the number one stolen item in in retail. There's a reason like you feel like a criminal when you walk into a, uh, a retail outlet and an alarm goes off when you right lift the plastic bin or you have to get someone to unlock the case so that you could buy this product. And then you ask yourself like, well, why is that? For the same reason that viral video talked about, 
there was, you know, one brand or, you know, one conglomerate that owned 80% of the market could charge what they wanted to charge for a product probably were greatly overcharging for, for this commodity. And we've all had the experience of you know, going through Target checkout and maybe we have like five items and you're like, it's $117. And you're like, what in the world did I buy? And you bought razor blades. That's crazy. Like nobody wants to spend that kind of money on razor blades. Nobody really wants to even be shaving probably. Like it's something we do because we don't have a choice. So the, the hair on our face will keep growing if we don't. That was the, Mike, I, I think through his his really creative approach to storytelling and being able to leverage social media at a time that it was less competitive than it is now. And and if you did things right, you could really get a lot of our media. He was able to unlock that that kind of pent up frustration about, yeah, yeah, Gillette is overcharging me for these razors. Like, this is crazy. Like, why, like, why don't I have more consumer choice? Like, this is this is nuts. And, and even the name of the company, right? Dollar Shave Club, right? Most of the products were not a dollar, but just everything about that was this irreverent approach to to being mission driven around the idea that look there's you can get a equally good shave for a lot less money and not feel like you're being taken advantage by a conglomerate just because they can that was really the beginning of all these direct consumer brands that were waking up and saying like hey like don't buy this product just because it's what your parents bought 30 years ago and don't use this toothpaste just because that's what you you know were told uh, that's what you were growing up on like open up your eyes ask your own questions make your own decisions and then be a part of those brands that you think represent you and and, uh, and I just think that that more than anything that Dollar Shave Club got that right when I work with B2B SaaS companies one of the challenges they face is that the marketing buffet is extensive there's so many things that you can do Inevitably, you find startups that rally around one or two channels. For Dollar Shave Club, obviously, it was video. For a lot of companies, it could be social media or content marketing. How did you come around to, or what was the reason why you decided to focus on direct marketing, which is not as sexy as a video or, or, or social media, but it's been around for a long time and it's super effective. Two questions. One is, why your interest in direct marketing? And how is Posty's approach to direct marketing different from all the other companies out there? Well, I'm, I have to admit, I love both those questions. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so first and foremost, my co-founder, Jonathan, and I didn't come around to the mission of solving the direct mail space or, or problem or challenges in this, in, in this channel. That, that wasn't where it started. It really started as a reaction to the big walled gardens that are, are search, and, search and social, just gaining way too much power and, and creating a lot of great value, but also creating a lot of heartburn up and down brand and executive teams and marketing teams. The truth is, say, the Dollar Shave Club era, those were the golden ages of platforms like Facebook and Google and YouTube providing tools that we we'd never seen before. Partly it's just the, the pure scale, right? At one point, like everybody was on Facebook and and it was ubiquitous with the internet and it was really nice and convenient to be able to reach everyone on one website, essentially. The sophistication in tools and use of data and the emergence of machine learning and predictive modeling, all these things that we used to do, but in a more analog way with less sophistication, those channels really were able to invest in. And it made us all look like really smart marketers. And for a long time, we got tremendous amounts of gains. But we all have felt the pain point of, you know, Google changing the algorithm and the bottom falling out of our search marketing or Facebook deciding that after milking tons of profits from us buying fans to our, our Facebook, you know, fan pages and building the engagement on their platform, they're now going to turn around and charge us to reach those, those fans where you paid to acquire. And that has dramatic effects on our growth and our P&L. For us, the kind of final straw was like just the oversaturation. Every brand, you know, in the beginning, it was like the, the disruptor brands that we're finding out how to work on how to manage demand gen on Facebook. And then Facebook did a great job pulling over lots of you know, huge portions of brand advertising dollars and the automotive manufacturers and entertainment platforms and CPG brands, et cetera, were, were pumping lots of their, their marketing budgets into those platforms and ad rates go up. And it seems like the savvier we get at marketing those platforms, we just can't, we can never catch up with the inflation on ad rates. And so you never are able to run those channels profitably. So 
So for us, it was just a matter of, okay, well, what's the next channel? Like we, we, we need to diversify our media mix, exactly what you were just talking about. And we first started looking at other digital channels and emerging channels. And, and there was nothing that had enough scale to make it worth the effort. Snap was just getting started. They didn't have an ad platform at that point. There was no TikTok. There just, there just was, was nothing that rivaled the scale of, of a Facebook, of a YouTube, you know, Google. We started spending more time offline. And in offline, there are a lot of great channels, but, but DM caught our attention, attention again because a lot of the components of it are very, very similar to digital channels. It's a channel that allows for for targeting and, and applicable data use so that you can be razor focused on who you engage with. There's direct measurement. You're able to understand who you're engaging with and you're able to triangulate you know, that conversion data. So what's working, what's not working from your marketing experience. And it's big and scalable. It's bigger than Facebook, it's bigger than Google. Everybody has an address and, and anyone with an address is reachable through, through direct mail. So you put those three things together, big and scalable, lots of data, which makes it a test and optimizable channel and direct measurement. And the reality is it looks very similar to how we execute Facebook campaigns and Google campaigns. So that's how we got there. It wasn't a direct path to direct mail. It was a reaction to a big macro challenge we saw in the marketing landscape. Scott Galloway talks a lot about the digital duopoly between Facebook and Google. And if you're a brand and you want to leverage advertising, you, ha you have no choice. You have to use one or the other. And at the same time, I think a lot of marketers are scrambling because every single channel is chock-a-block with competitive options and everybody's trying to leverage them. Direct mail seems old school. It really seems like in some respects an anachronism, but it's not. I mean, it's alive and it's well and brands are still using it. Do you think the modern marketer is thinking about direct mail these days? Is it is it front and center to them or do they have to be educated on the benefits, the impact and the fact that there are lots of ways to measure it? Because the modern marketer, it's all about quantifying their performance. If they can show that they're doing the job, that's awesome. But with the rise of the dark web, which I want to talk to you about, those things are becoming less obtainable. I think the same mindset of marketers that first looked at Facebook and thought, hmm, there's something interesting here. Even before Facebook was building ad tools or, to, or you know, marketing tools on their own platform, they, they were trying to figure out creative ways to engage the Facebook audience. Those same marketers are, are absolutely engaged with direct mail and have been for a while and are recognizing the value and, and we're trying to figure out ways to kind of infiltrate that channel in a very kind of test and optimization and measurable way. We've seen it from the start and we've been at it about about six years now. With that being said, there's also a sea of really savvy brands that have relied on direct mail, even through the digital era. This year, the last numbers that I saw published said there's going to be about $50, million, or sorry, $50 billion spent in direct mail by advertisers just in the US alone. And it's, it's a non-national election year. That just tells you something. Ad dollars are up in the channel and that's not happening by accident. That's yeah, you know, partly because the I think we recognize like the value of, of, of everything has has grown, right? The venture dollars that are flowing in bigger than ever. Consumer spending's never been stronger. Expendable income's never been stronger. And so there there's opportunities to market into your you know target audience more aggressively than ever before. But at the same time, the platforms that you've relied on, you know, namely Facebook and Google, have become harder and harder to actually find profitable customers on, or at least beyond a certain ceiling of, of scale. Definitively, the savvy marketers that are cutting edge and forward thinking, ironically, are well aware of and, and very uh, focused on, on direct mail. I think the type of advertisers are the ones that are on our platform or were, have been for years and, and are, we're very grateful to have a company like, like Posty that was building technology to give them the same access to predictive modeling and measurement and targeting and programmatic capabilities than, than kind of traditional methods of, of deploying direct mail. And every day we have more and more inbound uh, markers and brands that 
either are looking for a better way to do direct mail that have already kind of ex ex experimented with the channel and seen some positive benefit, but aren't satisfied with the, the tools. And then we have new advertisers that are aware that their competitors are, are deep in the channel and, and they don't have the experience and are looking for kind of the fastest path to scale and success within the channel. Without getting too deep into the weeds, can you talk about how marketers, how brands can quantify their success with direct mail? Because the model is that you do some targeting by geography, postal code, zip code, however you want to do that. Then there's some kind of reaction happens. What are the metrics? What are the KPIs involved in direct mail? Yeah. So the beauty of direct mail is it's an addressable channel, meaning that it's not about contextual targeting or not about, doesn't have to be about zip code targeting or census block targeting or whatnot that some more traditional markers might remember on the channel for. It's an individual living in a household the same way that it's one-to-one -one on programmatic or email or SMS or search or Facebook. In a world where there's so much access to first party data within brands and an ability to really get to know and understand your consumer directly. You're not relying on understanding the basic demographics of a zip code around a, a retail location that your product is sold in. You're now selling directly to that consumer or some portion of your revenues generated from direct consumer sales. And you can unlock a lot of insights into that. Those insights can be used to, to target on digital channels and can also be used to target on it through direct mail. Direct mail, you're targeting individuals at specific addresses. And when you're selling direct to consumer or you have a POS system that is capturing a one-to-one -one identity map between a, a transactor and who that person is, a converter and that person, the Posty platform, it's not the only one, but Posty uh, makes it clean and real-time and simple to map that identity from a transaction back to the recipient of a piece of direct mail. But there's much deeper methods that we, we can certainly go into fear boring, talking too deeply about measurement, but any action where identity data can be captured, whether it's a mobile application action or a website action or POS action at a, at a retail outlet that captures that data, that can all be used in, in real time very cleanly to map back to audiences that um, receive an ad through through the mail. And, and part of the game with measurement is then, you know, understanding not just what was successful in the past, but being able to make good decisions and that will deliver reliable, similar results the next time you execute that same strategy or tactic. We all think about like, and you actually mentioned it as well, like measurement as, as being this way to kind of justify that what we did is right. When I think about growing a business as a CEO, I think about you know, measurement more as the confidence in believing that if I do more of what I just did, I'll get similar results. And, um, and direct mail is, enables that. You could argue that many marketers have this myopic view of digital marketing. The marketing landscape is digital and many of them have been raised in an all digital, all web environment. So they don't know anything different. Magazine advertisements to them, newspaper ads seem like anachronisms more than anything else. How does a marketer blend digital marketing with direct mail? How do they create a value proposition in which one plus one equals three. Is it easy to do? Is it easy to, to get those two different vehicles to seamlessly work together? Look, no, nothing is easy. If it was easy, we'd all be launching, you know, brands and reaching certain levels of success. It's, it's really hard to do. But I think your question is probably more when you take the savvy, you know, trained marketer who's used to a sophisticated set of tools it does direct mail or, you know, omni-channel become more difficult. And I think the answer is depends which channels that you're using and the clarity of, of measurement in them. There are just channels that are easier to measure and there are channels where there's more transparency. Facebook and Google have positives and negatives. They make it really easy to have complete transparency on their own platforms with their own reporting structures. Uh, so you understand exactly what Google thinks your KPIs are and what Facebook thinks their KPIs are. They make it much harder to understand things like incrementality or lift of using um, those ad platforms on, on top of other channels. And that's something that's been going on for years and years and years, right? There's the, the argument of first touch, first last touch, first media mix modeling and multi-touch attribution and, and whatnot. Yeah, you know, direct mail is a unique channel in that 
you have a lot of variance in the KPIs that, that you're using at different times to measure effectiveness of, of your campaigns, the return ad spend, et cetera. For example, there are times when you're in growth mode and your due north is the is the most amount of scale, it's a land grab and the most efficient cost per acquisition. And if that's your due north, direct mail as a channel can can play really nicely with your digital channels and help you understand exactly what your cost per acquisition from budget spent in direct mail is. You may be a more mature brand that's looking and saying we have a media mix and we're more about profitability right now. It's not so much a land grab. Any new incremental channel, we also want to be able to see um, what the incremental effect over other channels are. Direct mail, because it's not a walled garden. It's not Facebook owning the data and dictating what data they're going to give you and what data they're not going to give you, oftentimes pump up and, and make performance of ad dollars on their platforms look better. Your direct mail, you have control over. So if, if all of a sudden what you're looking for is how does this specific addressable audience within my target um, CRM or my prospect pool perform when direct mail is added, what does the incrementality look like? What does the lift look like? Well, direct mail measurement or, you know, has, has the capability to, to, to show you exactly what the incremental value of that media spend looks like and really anything in between. To, to me, that, that's one of the things that are that's beautiful. It can be dangerous as well because direct mail offers more views a, a, and many times a cleaner view of a performance than even Facebook or Google will. And so a marketer needs to come to the channel understanding that they need to look at different measurement t- tactics or, or strategies differently. That you know, just because Facebook says this is your... Last click CPA that doesn't mean that there's any incrementality in the value of the, that ad dollar, those ad dollars that you pumped into that channel. And if you're comparing last click Facebook CPA to incremental, you know, lift on on direct mail, that that probably is a dangerous comparison. But if you're looking at at like measurement, then I think you come to trust the direct mail channel a bit more than you can trust your digital channels. Earlier in the conversation, I mentioned the dark web, and a lot of marketers are grappling with the idea that not everything can be quantified, given that in their experience in recent years, everything is quantifiable. And I think a lot of marketers are trying to figure out how do they generate ROI? How do they show their boss that what they're doing is working? How do they prove that they're doing what they're supposed to do? And I am curious about how direct mail fits into this whole dark web, dark social, not terribly able to quantify what we're doing landscape. Well, the beauty of of direct mail and, and those marketers who are engaging and exploring the channel right now, which which if any of your listeners are not yet engaging in the channel, I highly recommend them starting to, as it becomes more and more difficult to measure performance online through changes in operating systems and privacy regulations, et cetera. The beauty of direct mail is that the match key is not a cookie. It's not an, right. an abstract you know, digital fingerprint. It's it's a, a name and an address. And when you engage with a consumer that's you know, willing to share name and address, you know, they know exactly what data they're sharing with you. And they're doing so in a very compliant, upfront, transparent way, which is respectful to the consumer and the brand is presenting respectful. But it also means that if iOS 14 blows the cookie away, it affects you know, your ability to measure just as cleanly and direct mail because address still exists. The U.S. government didn't take away our addresses, right? That's not a thing, right? The way that Apple can take away a cookie or, or deem it irrelevant. We think a lot about that think per se that digital advertising is going to die in any um, respect, but some of the ease and transparency of what works online and what doesn't work online is not going to be so clean. There are going to be challenges. It's going to create some fits for marketers and brands. By the same token, I think what we're all going to see, I've done you know, my own analysis and research through many times throughout the years, is that the ROI, the return on ad spend that some of these big you know, walled gardens were telling us we were getting, we weren't actually getting. Mm-hmm. So we start pulling back budgets and all, and we don't see the same you know, proportionate decline in total conversions or total customers or, or revenue. And, and I think that's just the byproduct is going to be, it's going to shed some light on to maybe some of the inaccuracy and, and, and over-reliance on some of the, the performance KPIs that these wall gardens were 
giving us access to. It's something that, again, for the life of our company, direct mail just doesn't have that same pain point. There's a lot more transparency in how measurement works because it is one-to-one tied to an actual consumer rather than this ephemeral digital representation of a consumer. Well, thanks for all the great insight about direct mail, something that I haven't explored in recent episodes of uh, the podcast. One final question, where can people learn more about you and Posty? Our website is filled with information, use cases, case studies, how to get started, et cetera. And there's a request for information or functionality as well. And our team will get in touch with you. Certainly, I'm always reachable through LinkedIn. That kind of is my go-to. So feel free to find me there. And I think that'll be a good way to get everybody started. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Marketing Spark. If you enjoyed the conversation, leave a review, subscribe via Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app and share via social media. To learn more about how I help B2B SaaS companies as a fractional CMO, strategic advisor and coach, send an email to mark at markevans.ca or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll talk to you later.